Hello, my name is Suzanne Detreville. I'm a professor of operations management at the University of Lausanne's Faculty of Business and Economics. And today I'm going to show you how to get started using our cost differential frontier calculator. You can find the tool at our website cdf-oplab.unil.ch. So before I show you how to use the tool, I'd like to first show you some of the results that we get with the tool. So here's a fairly standard result. On the horizontal axis, we've got the relative lead time, uh, which goes from zero to one. A relative lead time of zero says that when we make the decision about what to produce, we know what demand is and we produce to order. A relative lead time of one corresponds to the longest lead time that we're considering. If, for example, we have a contract manufacturer on the other side of the globe who offers a lead time of 100 days, that means we have to make a decision about what to produce 100 days in advance, that is going to define our relative lead time of one. If we think about a relative lead time of 0.3, that might be a more closely located contract manufacturer who offers a lead time of 30 days. Now, on the vertical axis, we have the required cost differential. And that tells us, for a given relative lead time, how much cheaper does the product have to be to compensate for that lead time. So here we see that the product coming with a relative lead time of one has to be 39% cheaper than the local make-to-order cost, just to break even. Uh, keep in mind, we're not considering any other forms of supply risk. We're not considering difficulties with innovation, uh, communication, uh, getting stuck at customs. This is only uh, the exposure to demand volatility. Let's first talk about the volatility because that's going to be one of the most important parameters. Typically, managers uh, don't know what their demand volatility is, but there is a simple calculator that we've embedded in the tool that helps them to get a pretty good intuition of what the volatility is. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about median demand. That is a value of demand where 50% of the time demand is going to be lower, 50% of the time demand is going to be higher. Then we're going to think about a demand peak. Uh, in this case, we are imagining that a demand peak might be three times median demand. In other words, if median demand is 100 units, then a demand peak would be 300 units. And then we're going to ask the question, how often does this kind of peak occur? Let's suppose that we could expect this kind of demand peak one demand period out of 10. We put this into the calculator, and it is going to estimate that our demand volatility would be 86%. Note that this corresponds to the full lead time. The retail price is pretty straightforward, so now let's go to the short lead time cost. With the short lead time cost, we're thinking about a product that is made to order, and we have full knowledge about what demand is. Uh, so the lead time is short enough that we don't have to decide what to produce until we have that full knowledge of demand. What's going to happen in the calculator is it's going to tell us how much cheaper, that is, what is the required cost differential uh, to uh, make us indifferent between paying this short lead time cost or having a cheaper cost that goes with an extended supply chain. If, for example, we have a cost differential of 30%, that means that we would be working with a long lead time cost of 30.8 relative to our short lead time cost here of 44. Now let's talk about the residual value. 
By the residual value, we mean how much of the value is left if a unit is still in inventory at the end of the demand period. When the unit enters inventory, it has the value that we paid to have it produced. It could be 44 for a unit that is produced with a short lead time cost. It could be uh, 30.8 if we have a 30% cost differential. So that's what we start with. Now, as the unit sits in inventory during the demand period, we're paying an inventory holding cost. And this inventory holding cost is going to cover things like capital costs, insurance, uh, the fact that we had to build a new warehouse because we had quite a bit of inventory, uh, and it also includes the fact that as we have large quantities of inventory, the probability of obsolescence goes up. So we're going to be putting uh, all of these values together, and that will reduce the value of inventory um, that we have sitting there for a full demand period. Uh, we can uh, consider, for example, a unit that we produced offshore for a cost of 30 that had a 10% inventory holding cost over a demand period of one month. Um, in that case, its residual value would be 27. Sometimes we also have a fashion product, and there we can't retain it in inventory. At the end of the selling season, we need to sell it for whatever the market will give us. And in that case, the residual value is going to be that below-cost salvage value. The next input that we have to the model is going to be our minimum service level. The minimum service level is going to determine our order quantity or the maximum inventory that we're willing to hold. Now, the calculator is going to calculate for us what is called the critical fractile. The critical fractile is the service level that is going to do the best job of balancing the overstock cost with the lost profit because we don't have a unit in stock and we lose the sale. So that we have the option of setting our minimum service level to that critical fractile. In many cases, however, companies feel that the service level represented by the critical fractile isn't going to offer a high enough level of customer service. So the calculator is going to compute the effective minimum fill rate that is going to result from the minimum service level that has been input. And that tells us whether we are offering a high enough a fill rate to make our customers happy. Um, if the fill rate that the market requires is higher than what the tool says would be achieved for a given service level, uh, then it's possible to increase the minimum service level until the required fill rate is achieved. Okay, so let's talk about what happens as we vary some of these parameters. Uh, so, uh, in the initial results that I showed you, we had a salvage value, a residual value of 20. And uh, we're going to stick with a volatility of 86%. And what we saw was the required cost differential for the full lead time was 39%. In other words, the long lead time alternative would need to have a unit cost that is 39% cheaper than 44 for us to break even. We also considered a residual value in an order up to model that was somewhat higher. Um, we looked at a value of 27, where we purchased the unit at 30 with a long lead time, and uh, then we had an inventory holding cost, including obsolescence of 10%. So we have a residual value of 27. Uh, changing to a residual value of 27, we see that the required cost differential drops to 29%. Let's also ask the question, what happens if our marketing department says that the minimum fill rate that can be considered without a risk of getting customers seriously unhappy and perhaps losing the business would be 95%.
we can then explore what service level we have to put in to have a minimum fill rate of 95%, we see that this is going to require a 97% service level. That is a 97% chance that all demand will be satisfied. And this will raise the required cost differential for the full lead time to 41%. Finally, let's ask the question, what happens if we were a little bit too optimistic with our residual value and if the actual average residual value were more like 10 as opposed to 20 or 27? Here we see that that is going to push the required cost differential up to 57%. So now I've given you an idea of how the tool works and uh, how to estimate the values that you're going to put into the tool. Uh, for more information and also con with contact information, if you have any questions, go to our website, cdf-oplab.unil.ch. Thank you for watching.